Well, I have been uh, blessed in my life with both a Proverbs 31 mother and a Proverbs 31 wife. Mom passed away five years ago this past Tuesday. Can't believe it's already been five years. I was able to read this passage that I read this morning with her there listening in her church in Tennessee several years ago before they moved here. It was a Wednesday night kind of informal service of some sort, but it was, it fell on a mother's day. And so we were happened to be there and I uh, was able to go to this uh, dinner and the service and, and read that passage with, with my mom sitting there. It was great. Read the same passage right here in this place at her funeral five years ago. Dad's here this morning. Praise the Lord. Mom was married to dad for 61 years. And she did you good and not evil all the days of her life. (laughs) And he knows it very well. The last five years of her life was pretty rough. The last two especially were very, very difficult. Uh, About a 10-year journey with Alzheimer's. And along the way there, as it was getting really hard, I would, uh, uh, in my uh, not-so-encouraging way, would try to encourage Dad. And I said, Dad... She took care of you for 55 years. Now you get to take care of her for five. (laughs) That's a pretty good deal. (laughs) And he wouldn't argue. Kim and I will celebrate 34 years in July. Now, I didn't plan it at the time. It wasn't conscious. I didn't even realize it until a few years into my marriage with Kim. But mom and Kim are a lot alike. (laughs) What was I planned? It was, it was just God's grace toward me, of course. They were two peas in a pod. They were fast and longtime friends. And you know what they would do? They would always agree together against me. <laughs> that didn't take long at all. And a few years into the marriage, people would ask, you know, questions about about. How does your family like Kim? And I said, what are you talking about? They love her more than they love me. And I was good with that. Mom was and Kim is a Proverbs 31 excellent wife and mother. And I have been exceedingly blessed to have them both in my life. Needless to say, they have been a prof and continue to be, whether I'm talking about my mom or my wife, a profound influence, 1A and 1B. Kim wins out because you're only one with your spouse, your wife, and because she's had me for 34 years and mom just got the first 18. So, And the blessings of godly women continue in our lives. Our boys have uh, wives that love the Lord and love them. Mary Catherine and Katie, they are an answer to prayer. Both were about 21 years in the prayer making. And they are two of our favorite people in the entire world because they love our boys, they put up with our boys, and they are bearing these beautiful grandchildren. <laughs> We love them so much. The influence of a wife and a mother is beyond estimation. Their power for good or evil is staggering. From Eve to Noah's wife to Sarah to Mary, there's no higher calling. No higher calling than to be a godly wife and mother. There's no vocation more worthy than wife and mother. And today, as a church, we rise up and we bless the Lord for our mothers and our wives. Today, we rise up and we bless them, as Proverbs 31 indicates. Five years ago Tuesday... I burst into tears when mom drew her last breath because I was overwhelmed with the thought of how important she had been in my life. I would not be who I am. I would not be where I am today apart from my mom, Betty McKnight, also known as Mama, also known as Granny. In fact, we were at her tombstone tombstone yesterday 
and uh, was reminded what's on her tombstone. It's very simple, her name, and then this phrase, loving wife and mother. There was a common trait between my mom and my wife, and that is they both have a propensity to worry. Now, this just tells you that even a Proverbs 31 woman isn't perfect. Kim will start down this path some days. Down this path of I'm not living much longer. I want this song sung at my funeral. We are old and blah, blah, blah. And I cut her off. I cut her off every time. And I say to her, we are not old. Okay? 90 years old is old. Okay? Paul Paul is old. <laughs> we are not old. And you aren't going anywhere because God knows how much I need you and I can't live without you. When I think about what mom provided for my brother and me growing up, and I think about what Kim provided for our children growing up, there's a common denominator. And you might can relate to this in your house and, and in your growing up. They brought virtues to the home and the family that the dad did not. The dad and the dad. <laughs> Things like nurture and encouragement and reassurance. Things like compassion and understanding and unfailing, unconditional love. This is what I was the recipient of. Of the many praises of my own mom that I could share with you, and there would be many, many, one stands out for its simplicity and its sacrifice and its example. I was maybe in the first grade, maybe second grade. I don't remember. Early, early grade school. And I had homework. Yes, back in the 70s, second graders had homework. Okay. And I was stressed out about my homework because I always wanted to do everything perfectly. I didn't want it to be any mistakes. Except for this brief wilderness of junior high, I wanted and made straight A's my entire life. And so I was very, very stressed about my homework, okay? Second grade can be very stressful, all right? <laughs> and so mom would be there. Mom was very busy. I mean, she worked and she kept the house and washed all the clothes and cooked all the meals and did all the grocery shopping. She was very, very busy. But somewhere in this little stretch of my life, and I don't even think it went for the whole school year, but somewhere during this stretch, and I had this, this homework and I was so stressed out about doing it perfectly and I would want my mom to sit right beside me the entire time I did my homework just in case I needed her. And, and she gave just a little bit of pushback. You know, she had plenty of other things that she could have been doing. She wasn't like she was leaving the house. You know, she'd, still, she'd be there to be, to be called upon, but that wasn't good enough for me. She had to literally sit right beside me on the couch while I did my homework. If I needed her, and I rarely needed her, but if I did, and of course she did. She sat right there as long as that need lasted in my little life. One of Kim's many roles with our kids was buffer to my strict discipline. The other role was related. She was the CEO of fun and gifts. <laughs> CEO, CFO, COO. <laughs> if there was going to be fun, <laughs> if there were going to be gifts, it will have to originate with Kim in my house. There was one time I can remember in particular putting one of our children to bed. They were fairly young and saying nighttime prayers. And this particular child was complaining about mom to me privately. And I cut this child off and I looked them in the eye and I said, if your mother wasn't here, your life would be miserable. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you would think you were in the army. There would be a 530 roll call, <laughs> drills. I mean... You need to thank God for your mother who's buffering and balancing me out. Moms, your role is vital, essential, irreplaceable. You have a role that cannot be delegated away. There is no app for this. No artificial intelligence and no robot can raise your child. For some of you here and some of you hearing me, you have a double row. You are both mother and father rolled up in one. May the Lord help you and may the Lord help the church to help you. The rest of us mere mortals 
stand in awe of what single moms do to raise their kids in the Lord. Where do we turn in the Bible for help for this topic? It's interesting. When it comes to the Bible directly addressing mothers as mothers, the Bible actually has very little to say. It appears that common grace is the greatest teacher here. It appears that generation after generation is the greatest teacher here. Now, there are many verses that reference mothers, of course, all through the Bible. And there are many verses that tell children to honor and obey their parents and their mothers, especially throughout the book of Proverbs. But there are precious few verses that speak directly to women as wives and as mothers. There's a handful. And the most extensive and the most thorough of all of these is Proverbs 31. It is the most descriptive. It is the most memorable. If you've been a Christian very long at all, if you know your Bible very well at all, it's kind of code. People say Proverbs 31 woman, and everybody knows what that means because of how memorable this passage is. I mean, phrases like she does not eat the bread of idleness. That sticks with you. This is one of those passages then that is descriptive and memorable And I know as you ladies heard it and as you ponder it from time to time, you would say it is lofty. You would say, you know, I think it's meant to be encouraging. I think the tone of this passage is meant to spur you on to love and good deeds. I I think it's meant to say excel still more. I think it's meant to put wind into your sails. But I'm sure there's been many a wife and many a mother that reads this and just feels crushed by it. It feels like the whole law of God has then descended upon you. And this impossible standard, this ideal standard has been set there that no one can ever reach. And in some part, that's true. It is impossible uh, apart from God's help and grace. It's lofty. It's, it's convicting, I'm sure. You know what I think it's like? I think there's a New Testament counterpart. I think it's called elder qualifications. The elder qualifications, there's like 23 of them. And Timothy and Titus, and you put them all together, and every honest man looks at that list and says, this is impossible. Who can do this? Who can, who can arrive at this and stay there for some period of time? I mean, the bar is really, really high for elders, and the bar is really, really high here for the Proverbs 31 woman. Ladies, I just want to remind you, before we get into the text itself, that Proverbs 31 is a target for you to aim for in your life. It is a goal to shoot for, and you will not hit it every day. Just go ahead and own that. Just go ahead and accept that. You're not going to hit this every single day. And that means that God's grace is there for your misses. God's grace is there when the arrow doesn't even launch, or when the arrow is just kind of crooked and flails off to the side. As we've tried to stress in our songs this morning, in the prayer this morning, there is abundant grace in Jesus for every wife and mother. Yet, Proverbs 31 is still for the Christian woman, Christ-likeness for a godly wife and mother. This is still God's will for your life as you're able. It is God's desire for your character. It is God's prescription for your behavior. Now, we're in Proverbs, right? And we're in the end of Proverbs. Here is the conclusion, the last verses of this book on what? What's the theme of Proverbs? Wisdom. Proverbs is God's wisdom for daily living. And so here we are reading more about God's wisdom. Here it is as the conclusion of this great book on wisdom. In fact, Proverbs 31 is wisdom in action. Proverbs 31 woman is wisdom. Some would even say this is a symbol of wisdom. But it is wisdom poured through the woman into the home. Poured through her life and character into her community. Into her world. Everything about this in some way, connects back to the book of Proverbs. In some way, is either an affirmation of the things that's been said on the positive side, or it's in contrast to certain kinds of women that Proverbs talks about. And so we need to see it in its context. 
The Proverbs 31 woman is God's way of saying, this is how you live wisely in this fallen world. This is how you become a faithful steward of your time, treasure, talent, your energy, your husband, your children, your servants slash employees, if you have them. Here's something else I learned this week about Proverbs 31 woman. This is an acrostic in the Hebrew alphabet. It uses all 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet in order to set forth these attributes and these virtues. And it is the only such acrostic in the entire book of Proverbs. Thus, it stands out. Thus, it was designed to be memorized and possibly even to be put to music. There are other acrostics like this in the Bible where you use, you know, A, B, C, D, and in this case, it's the Hebrew alphabet. There's others like this in the Bible, like Psalm 112. Psalm 112 is an acrostic that praises the righteous or just man through the Hebrew alphabet. Psalm 119, that's the one we all know about, right? Psalm 119 is an acrostic through the entire Hebrew alphabet, and it's praising God's word. Here in Proverbs... You have a similar thing going on. You have an A to Z of praise of the worthy woman, the noble woman, the excellent wife or mother being praised from A to Z. And this is in contrast to the ancient literature of the day. This is so fascinating to me. The ancient literature of the day outside of Judaism, outside of Israelite people, when it spoke of women, only spoke of them as decoration, Women were only viewed as those who had charm and beauty, and that was their worth and value, was how much charm and beauty, how much decoration they could bring to a man, to the world. Ancient literature presented women all beauty without character. Character wasn't even an interest. And here we have then the Israelite contrast. The Israelite contrast to this worldly fascination with beauty without virtue. There's nothing wrong with beauty. There is something wrong where there's beauty without virtue, without character. In fact, every Friday night at the Sabbath dinner table, the Israelite father and children would recite Proverbs 31. So let's dive in, shall we? Seven marks and you're on your own to take the notes this morning. They're one word each. Seven marks of an excellent wife and mother to cultivate in your life. By the way, we have over 50 active mothers in our church family. How exciting. Seven marks of an excellent wife and mother. Number one comes from verse 10. An excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above jewels. Number one, she is rare. She is rare. Uncommon. Different. And because she's uncommon and different, she is therefore has exceeding value. An excellent wife is like the Mona Lisa. Sistine Chapel. The Hope Diamond. Like wisdom itself presented throughout the book of Proverbs, her worth is more than her weight in rubies. She has inestimable worth and value. You want a biblical illustration of the Proverbs 31 woman in real life? It's Ruth. In fact, she's called a woman of noble character. Same word. Same word here as excellent in the New American Standard, verse 10, or noble. That describes Ruth. You can go read Ruth, those four short chapters, and you can see her nobility, her excellence, her virtues come through that little story. But the Proverbs 31 woman, this excellent wife, is rare. She's rare, not normal. She's rare, not average. She is priceless, not cheap. The excelling wife, then, has great worth. So when you find her, marry her, (laughs) and hold on and protect and value for the rest of your life. If you're here as a young man and you're not married, this is what to look for. One commentator said she is more precious than anything of this earth. More precious, more valuable, more, I don't know the word, excellent, than anything that this 
that this earth can set before us. That's why Proverbs 18.22 says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Proverbs 18.22. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So we begin with this rarity that she is. She is rare because of number two, and that's in verses 11 and 12. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. The second trait is she is trustworthy. She is trustworthy. Ladies, listen, this is uh, multifaceted trust. This is financial trust, emotional trust, spiritual trust, and sexual trust. Look at the text. The heart, the heart of her husband trusts in her. Continuous tense, present tense. The depths of his being, his soul, his feelings trust in her. Not in a way that we trust in God. Not in a way that says she's, she's sinless or perfect. I'm not making an idol of my wife and, and saying you alone can make me happy. That's idolatry. It's not the same level of trust that we have unconditionally, implicitly, totally in God, but the heart of her husband trusts in her. And because he trusts in her, and because she's trustworthy, he will have no lack of gain, no lack of profit, no lack of benefit throughout his life. When we're talking about human trust, though, we need to be real. Trust is earned. Somebody's got something going off somewhere. <laughs> Take a moment, everybody, to silence your phones if you haven't. That'd be helpful. This trust is earned, and it starts with the very first encounter, the very first date, the first conversation. And it builds, right? It builds every day after that. Part of her husband trusts in her. This is an ongoing project. This is trust that is tested and proven through trials and through temptations. Proven through sickness and in health. And this trust, this, this trustworthiness is invaluable. This is what makes her rare. It's what makes her worth far above jewels. It's infinitely valuable. Because there's no relationship without it. There's no parenting without it. There's no marriage without it. Without trust, you've got nothing. It's a house of cards. This is something, ladies, that you need to nurture every day of your life. If you're married here today and you're a mom, you need to nurture this trust. If you say you're going to do something, do it. If you say you're going to be somewhere, be there. Listen, keep your promises whether they're the huge promises of your wedding day or the very small promises of day-to-day -day living. They all matter. Keep your promises. This is a good word for all of us, right? Trustworthy. Ladies, I want to encourage you, challenge you to act and speak around other men, especially in a way that builds this trust that does not undermine it. You need to be reliable, dependable, Trustworthy. You need to be this way in every area of life. This is how the Christian life is lived, right? We don't have silos. We don't put our lives into compartments. We have one life and we are to live the same in every area of life. Home, work, community, friends, hobbies. It's in this trustworthiness then that he will have no lack of benefit, no lack of profit. It's in this trustworthiness that you will be an asset and not a liability. And if you're a trustworthy wife, then your husband can pursue his calling from God without undue distractions, without undue interruptions. Now, there's always distractions, there's always interruptions, that's life, right? But there's also a way to live as a godly woman in a way that supports and helps your husband fulfill his calling. And verse 11 and 12 is that way. It is that way. The old German commentators, Kyle and Delich, said this about her under this point. They said, quote, she is to him a perpetual spring of nothing but good. I told you it was lofty, right? 
She is to him a perpetual spring of nothing but good. This is because she is number three. And this is probably the emphasis of the whole passage. She is industrious. She is industrious. This is verses 13 to 19 and verse 24. She looks for wool and flax. She works with her hands in delight. She's like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it's still night. That's either late into the nighttime hours or early in the morning before the sun is risen. She gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. She's industrious. It goes on. She's an entrepreneur. She considers a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength. She makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. There's a tirelessness here, in fact. There's a, a, an, in, an, an industry in her life, through her life. Verse 19, she stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands grasp a spindle. She's working constantly, constantly working. Verse 24, she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. I mean, just look at the verbs of these verses. Looks, works, brings, rises, gives, considers, girds, makes, senses, stretches, grasps, makes, sells, supplies. <laughs> She's industrious. She's not lazy. She does not eat the bread of laziness. Book of Proverbs. She's gone to the ant. Chapter 6, right? She's gone to the ant and she's observed her ways. The ant, without a taskmaster, standing over her shoulder, quote, prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. It's very clear in this passage that she doesn't create poverty for the family. She helps to alleviate it. She doesn't drain wealth. She creates it. Alan Ross, in his commentary, said, quote, shrewd, she's a shrewd businesswoman making wise investments from her earnings. There is no foolish purchasing nor indebtedness here. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, from Proverbs 31, she is industrious in the home and she is industrious outside the home. Ladies, I will remind you that work was established by God before the fall. Right? Work Ladies and gentlemen, work is pre-fall. It's part of what God said, this is good. Work is good. Work is good for us and it's good for our neighbor. It existed before sin. And she lives like it. Titus says that a young woman, a young married woman, is to be workers at home, quote unquote. Well, it's interesting because back then, Pretty much everybody was workers at home. You either had a, had a craft or a business or you're a farmer. I mean, the whole family worked and lived at home. And that really lasted in our world until about the Industrial Revolution, when the men started leaving the home and going off into the factories and into the offices. So for thousands of years, pretty much all work was done at home. And so when it says she used to be a worker at home in Titus, this could mean, obviously, the caring for the home and the children, but also it could also mean a, a business of some sort going on in the home. When Titus says be workers at home, it doesn't mean that you can't be workers outside the home. What it does mean is you can't neglect the home and the family because of outside interest or jobs. You, you can't kick that to the curb to fulfill this over here. Be a worker at home, and as she indicates here, industrious outside the home. I mean, we could just say of this woman, there's not a lazy bone in her body. Amen? I mean, is that fair? <laughs> With proper focus, discipline, and time management, you can have outside interest and yet be workers at home. Especially in the 21st century, with every modern convenience known to man. I don't think any of you are out scrubbing your clothes on, on a washboard like my grandmother did and running them through a wringer <laughs> like my grandmother did at some point. All these modern conveniences, all these creature comforts we have, we can, we can manage. 
Once again, go to the ant if you need a reminder. God has established that little creature for our good. <laughs> Ladies, let me tell you what your number one threat to being industrious is. Screens. Screens, unless that screen is your industry, <laughs> you know, unless that's work in some way. But by and large, and this applies to men too, applies to teenagers, I mean, we're not picking on anybody here, but screens are the number one threat to our being industrious. It's my number one threat. It's most likely your number one threat. Now let me give you a number one tip to being industrious. Constantly ask yourself this question. Is this a good use of my time? Is this a good use of my time? In other words, is there something that my husband or my children or my house or my job or my church or my friends or self-care calls for that I could be doing right now that would be productive and industrious. And self-care is on that list as it should be. That doesn't mean we can't recreate, doesn't mean we can't have fun, doesn't mean we can't watch TV. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying as a general rule of thumb, if we want to grow in being industrious, we need to watch out for screens and we need to ask, is this the good use of my time? The Proverbs 31 woman would show us that a true woman of God is not for decoration. It's not for somebody to be always dressed to the nines and, and this fine kind of dainty sort of woman. Although you may be that at times. But that's not the Proverbs 31 woman. Okay, The woman of God from this passage has grit. The woman of God has determination. A work ethic, fortitude. In other words, she's not afraid to get her hands dirty. She's not afraid to work. She's not afraid to sweat. It's okay to be sore from hard work. This is godliness in action. This is wisdom in action. It's not just sitting around talking to people or studying the Bible all the time or even praying all the time. Unless that's all you can physically do, then then by all means. But this portrait shows us someone who is active and industrious and getting after it in life, not waiting for things to happen. But it's more than that. <laughs> she works with her hands. Look at verse 13. She works with her hands in delight. She works with her hands in joy. In other words, Whatever her work is that she's doing, she's doing it willingly and she's doing it joyfully. Again, a model for every believer. A model for all of us. She enjoys her work. My mom used to love for me to come home from college and bring her my dirty clothes. <laughs> she loved it. She, she loved cooking meals. For us, it wasn't a burden, it was the joy of her life. She worked with delight, enjoying the work of caring for those God has entrusted to you. Versus, right, there's options here there's grumbling, there's complaining, there's whining, and there's procrastinating. That's not working with delight. Now, she is not industrious to live a life of ease and comfort, eating all the finest foods the world has to offer and wearing designer clothes and carrying $1,000 purses. That's not why she's industrious. She's industrious so she can do number four. Verse 20. She extends her hand to the poor and she stretches out her hands to the needy. This is why she works so hard. Number four, she is generous. She is generous. The needs of her home are met, and now she has an abundance to turn outside the home and meet the needs of others. Meet the needs less fortunate than her. She extends. She initiates. She reaches out. Her hand her open hand, her giving hand to the poor. Jesus said, the poor you'll have with you always. She notices them. 
She has compassion on them. She's merciful to them. She reaches out to them. How can I help you? And she stretches, she stretches out her hands to the needy. It's not passive. It's aggressive, charitable giving. Out of the abundance and the overflow of which God has blessed her and her family. Number five, number five comes from verses 21 and 22. Not only is she generous, she is prepared. She's prepared. She's not afraid of the snow for her household. Cold weather doesn't frighten her because they have jackets and coats and hats and gloves and socks and boots. And and all her household are clothed with scarlet. That's a fine linen She's made coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. This just speaks of her being prepared. She's thinking ahead. She plans. Uh, There's a preparedness for her life. As she thinks about those God has entrusted to her to care for. She's going to think of things. Oh my goodness, will she ever. (laughs) She's going to think of things that the dad husband will never think of. Never cross his mind when it comes to this realm of preparedness. We lived in California for four years. My wife thought about on a daily basis, what's going to fall off of these walls when we have an earthquake? And I mocked her and I scoffed her. (laughs) I said, you are paranoid and gave her all kinds of good natured grief for how prepared she was trying to make our little house and apartments for an earthquake. And we lived there for four years. And six months before we moved away, in January of 1994, the North Ridge earthquake happened. Seven point something on the Richter scale. We lived five miles from the epicenter. And our, our little house was trashed. 45 seconds. Bookcases coming off the... They were mounted to the walls, came off the walls, all cut... Everything in the kitchen opened up its doors and dumped into the floor. Refrigerator walked away from the wall and dumped everything in the floor. I mean, it was, it was that kind of event. Thankfully, the roof and the building didn't fall upon our heads. She had been thinking about that day for four years. <laughs> uh, once again, she can say, I was right and you were wrong. <laughs> Preparedness. Preparedness for what might come. Number six, number six, I I really struggle with the word for number six. It comes from verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Okay, that's kind of in their language, that's the courtrooms of the world. That's the courtrooms, that's the boardrooms, that's the places of decisions and power brokers, if you will, of the community. The judgments took place at the city gates. That's where criminals were brought and tried and cases were tried between Israelites, civil cases. And so her husband is known there. He's not a stranger in those circles. He's known there and he sits there among the elders of the land. In other words, he's one of them. My word for this is she is enhancing. She is enhancing of her husband. He has these judicial responsibilities in the gate. He is a trusted community member and a well-known leader or businessman or whatever it might be. And all of this is in part because she is his enhancer. She is his supporter. She is the wind beneath his wings. And this is because they're not in competition. Her fine reputation, Proverbs 31, enhances his reputation. His reputation enhances her reputation. It matters. She's enhancing of her husband. Now, I believe all six of these are summed up, are summed up for us. I don't think they're new ones. As we move on through the passage, verses 25 to 27, I think 25 to 27 give us a summary of one through six, okay? Let's read those verses one more time. Strength and dignity are her clothing, 
and she smiles at the future. So there's the preparedness. There's the uh, industriousness. Dignified and rare. She opens her mouth in wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She brings to the family and the community what a man can't always bring. Can't or won't or just plain doesn't. Kindness and wisdom. In verse 27, she looks well to the ways of her household and she does not eat the bread of idleness. That's really a summary, those three verses of everything that's been set up to this point. She's rare, she's trustworthy, she's industrious, she's generous, she's prepared, she's enhancing. And then finally, the result of one through six is number seven. She's praiseworthy. The result of being rare, trustworthy, industrious, generous, prepared, and enhancing is she's worthy of praise. And that's how it all ends. Her children rise up and bless her or praise her, her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly or excellent, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be what? Praise. Give her the product of her hands. Give her what she's earned. Give her what she deserves. And let her works praise her in the gates. I mean, you have to be pretty dense to miss this. Bless her, praises her. He then verbally does it. She shall be praised. Let her works praise. She's praiseworthy. This is so critical. I have failed in this so many times with both my mom and my wife. God, forgive me. I want to do better here. I want to be someone who daily recognizes and sees these traits, these qualities, these virtues. And give her the product of her hands. This is for now, ladies, you can rest for a moment. This is for the husbands in the room. This is for the, the fathers in the room. This is for the children in the room. This is now our charge, right? This is what we are to do with this passage. This is what we are to do today and every day in some way or the other. Thankful to God, encouraging of our wives and of our mothers. Give her, give her the product of her hands. Now, that's it. That's the list. What is the underlying explanation of all of them? What is the secret sauce of her success? What is the key of keys that unlocks all of these virtues in her life so that she can be this wisdom of God poured into her family and into her community? What is the fountain from which this refreshing spring called the excellent woman originates it's right there in verse 30. She fears the Lord. This is the spring from which all of these virtues originate. And the key that unlocks this kind of life. She fears the Lord. She reverences the Lord. She's in awe of the Lord. This speaks of her love for the Lord. This speaks of her faith in the Lord. This speaks of her trusting of God and His Word. If we unpack the fear of the Lord throughout the entire Bible, you would see that this is the, a great summary description of the person who knows, loves, trusts, and obeys God through Jesus Christ. She fears the Lord. She worships the Lord. She wants the Lord to be pleased with her life. She fears His discipline. She's in awe of His greatness. She worships the Lord. The book ends as the book began. Chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Here we are in the next to the last verse. This woman who fears Yahweh the God of history, the God of the Bible, the God of all creation, the, the woman who fears Yahweh shall be praised. This is the furnace that causes this fire of this godly, excellent, noble woman to burn. And it comes from God. 
It's the gift of God to the heart of a woman submitted to Him. Ladies, I don't know how you have done. I don't know how you are doing. But God does. And I want to just say as we close that God allows U-turns. God allows and gives second chances. You may be sitting here and saying, man, I'm, you don't know what my mother was like. You don't know the kind of upbringing I had. She was none of these things. She was the opposite of all these things. And I say, well, God is sovereign. Honor her anyway. And ask God for you to be the first in a long new line of a new legacy. Right? Maybe you've never seen any kind of model like this. Maybe it can start with you, with your house, with your children. Ladies, I just want to remind you that if you're convicted of sin right now, not false guilt, but convicted of sin by the Holy Spirit, to confess, to repent, and to start fresh today. This is the great thing about the Christian life. Forgetting what lies behind. Reaching forward to what lies ahead. Every single day, new mercies. Every single day we can start fresh. It's all behind us going forward. Starting from today and moving forward with a new life, new goals, new ambitions. Confess, repent, and start fresh. You can do that right now. You can do that right now, right where you sit. Start a new legacy today in your family. I want to give everyone now a few moments for some quiet reflection and prayer. A few moments for us to think about what we've heard, regardless of where we are in life and what our station in life and our callings are. So just bow your heads with me, please, and uh, give you a few moments to do this. Also, if you're a husband here or child, this gives you a few moments to pray for your wives, pray for your mothers if they're living, to thank God for them. After a few moments, we're going to have a closing song that will encourage your soul, that will remind us all of the gospel and our need for Christ. Father, we are uh, humbled by your word, challenged by it. There's so many great things here for men. This is really a list of Christ's likeness, male or female. Uh, the, these are all traits that we all need to embrace and, and grow in. And so pray that you'd help us to do this. We'd be everywhere from rare and trustworthy to worthy of appropriate praise among each other. Father, pray today that you would bless once again the moms in the room. Thank you for them. Will you give them your daily bread? Will you sustain their soul so that they might serve you as a mother, that they might do this with excellence, trusting in you for the strength that you provide? And Lord, as we'll sing now, we know that this is through Christ in us. It's not in us. It's not in our strength, but it's in Christ. We thank you for him. Amen.